Today, let's analyze Composed Upon Westminster Bridge, September 3, 1802, by William Wordsworth. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul, who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. The city now doth, like a garment, wear the beauty of the morning, silent, bare. Ships, towers, domes, theatres, and temples lie open on the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still. The title of this poem marks a time and place. From the onset, we see that the speaker here wants to keep a record of something, or hold on to an experience. They do not want this time and place, this moment, to be forgotten. The place is Westminster Bridge, which hangs over the River Thames in London. The time is September 3rd, 1802. What is significant about this time? The Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Buildings and factories and machinery were being manufactured faster than ever, and the world was entering a new era. It seemed that the time of nature had ended, and the time of infrastructure, of steel and concrete and smoke, had begun. What we'll see in this poem, in this sonnet, is a splendid morning view of the city. But that splendid display of nature will be juxtaposed with the infrastructures of civilization. We'll see the interesting dance between nature and civilization. Let's get into it, in between the lines. In line one, we realize that whatever the speaker is looking at, he's viewing it with utmost admiration. He says that this is the fairest, the most beautiful thing that Earth has to show. Line one and the title together introduce the contrast, even the conflict, between nature and civilization, nature and human infrastructure. The speaker is looking out at the wonderful view, which will be described further down. He's admiring nature saying that this is the most beautiful thing, yet he's standing on a bridge, a man-made thing. He's using human infrastructure to experience nature. By the way, him saying that this is the most beautiful thing can be considered hyperbole. He's likely exaggerating just how beautiful this site is. We see personification in line 1, with Earth given the ability to show us things. So the man is standing on the bridge. And he says the earth is showing him this uniquely beautiful view, this picturesque scenery. We see a tone of admiration, and also one of confidence. The speaker makes a bold claim that what he sees is the most beautiful view in the world. That must be why it is so important for him to record the time and place of this sighting. In lines 2 and 3, he criticizes anyone who would disagree with him that this is the most beautiful view. If anyone could pass by this site, if anyone could ignore it, if anyone could see it and not stop to look, to comment, their soul must be dull. The speaker projects a great deal of subjectivity and judgment. First, he makes the claim that this view is the best in the world. Then he says that anyone who does not agree with him is not just wrong, but soulless, or more accurately, dull of soul. This means if you can just walk past this scenery without stopping to look, you have no appreciation of beauty. You are somewhat unintelligent, in the sense that you don't know what real value, what real beauty is. Dull brings to mind not just a kind of stupidity, but also a kind of uninterestingness. Anyone who doesn't care about this kind of beauty must be boring. He says the sight is touching and majestic. We see why the speaker is so passionate and his opinions about this site are so strong. His soul was touched. When he first beheld the site, he was probably left speechless, shivering, crying. As we pay attention to diction, we notice that the word majesty has a lot of potential. Not only does this word mean great beauty, but it is also a term of address for royalty, as in your majesty. 
Perhaps the speaker is recognizing the royalty of nature, or the royalty and divine power of God through nature. Lines 4 and 5 begin to tell us what this view, what this majesty, what this grandeur is. The city, like a garment, like clothes, wears the beauty of the morning. This is a simile. The city wears the beauty of the morning like people wear clothes. The beauty is like a garment. Also, we have more strong personification going on. The city is wearing the beauty of the morning. Now let's pay attention to the details of these lines. First, we see that the city is capitalized. This is because this specific city is of importance. Remember the title. The here and the now are important to the speaker. The city is London, the capital of England, a very important city. So if the city is wearing the morning's beauty, we can say that without the morning's beauty, the city would be naked. In other words, the city, the creations of man, all the buildings and roads and vehicles have no beauty of themselves. They can only borrow the beauty of nature and wear it like a cloak. Okay, so what is the beauty of the morning? It might be the gentle sunlight that streams down through the clouds, down through the trees. It might be the chirping of birds, the wetness of the dewed grass, the quietness of the day before the hustle and bustle begins. The poem gets a little tricky at this point. After a semicolon, we have two adjectives that end the line. Silent, bare. What are these words describing? Are they describing the city, the morning's beauty, or are they describing the things listed in the next line? Well, maybe these words are positioned in this precarious spot so they can describe all of these things. First of all, how could the city be bare and silent? Remember, the city is dressed, it is wearing the morning's beauty. So how can it at the same time be bare, be naked? Well, it is early morning, and so the streets aren't yet busy. There is not much activity happening just yet. Bare in this case doesn't really mean naked, it means empty, empty of people and human activity. What about the beauty of the morning? How can the beauty of the morning be bare and silent? Well, the morning silence is beautiful and tranquil. What about bare? Well, the lack of humans and human interaction is beautiful to the speaker. When the streets start buzzing with people, then there is noise, chaos, conflict, pollution. So maybe the early morning is so beautiful to the speaker because the people are not there. But I think the words silent and bare most effectively describe the list of things in line 6. Let's look at lines 6 and 7. Ships, towers, domes, theatres and temples lie open onto the fields and to the sky. So these human creations, which are usually noisy and crammed with people, are now, in the early morning, silent and bare. It might have been a strange sight to the speaker to see empty ships, empty theatres. Now, in this moment, all these places are silent and bare. Note as we go through the poem that there is a constant juxtaposition of nature and civilization. First, we saw man admiring nature while standing on a bridge, a man-made thing. Then we saw the city wearing the beauty of the morning. Now we see ships, towers, domes, theatres and temples silent and empty. And open onto what? The fields, which are a part of nature, and also to the sky, which is a part of nature. Let's look at some details in these two lines. First, let's look at the list of man-made things the speaker is looking at. Each thing here is symbolic of the aspect of human life that it is connected to. The ships represent human travel, trade, commerce, or ability to interact with people from faraway countries. International relations. The towers represent governments and probably militaries. The domes represent our architectural and engineering prowess. Domes are elegant, beautiful structures that are often made with exquisite and technical designs. The theatres represent human entertainment and community. The temples represent, of course, human religion, our attempts to connect with the divine. 
So here, the speaker is looking at all these facets of human life, of society, of civilization. Instead of being open to people, these places are, for the moment, open onto the fields and to the sky. We see a strange harmony now between the man-made things and the natural things. Without humans in the way, even these man-made things can seamlessly coexist with nature. But there is a certain subtle connotation of open onto that I do not want you to miss. To be open onto or open to something can mean that you are vulnerable to it. For example, if you are playing chess and your king is open to attack, it means enemy pieces can attack it. To be open is to be uncovered, unprotected. If you are out in the open, it means you are in a vulnerable state. With this in mind, these two lines might be saying that eventually, Nature will overtake and consume us and all that we have built. Then, in 1802, and also now, in 2022, we are encroaching upon nature. We are subduing nature, but one day the tables will turn and nature will retaliate, perhaps wipe us out. All these ships and towers and domes we are building are open to the fields and sky. The fields represent the nature that is on the ground and the sky represents the nature above. Nature can attack us from below with earthquakes and volcanoes and so on. It can attack from above with floods and hail and so on. Ok, let's get back to the admiration of nature. In the next line, the speaker says that these man-made things are all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Here, with these images in line 8, we see what this garment, what this beauty looks like. Everything is bright and glittering in the early morning. The sunlight bounces off the metal surfaces and shines up from the grass, from the puddles, from everything. And the air is now smokeless. The pollutants, the exhaust from vehicles, factories and everything else is not yet going up into the air. And so, for the moment, the air is pure and clean. Let's remember that this is a sonnet. It is an Italian sonnet specifically. Such sonnets are divided into two sections. The first section has eight lines and should present a question or problem, while the second section has six lines and should present an answer or solution. This means within 14 lines we have a question and an answer, or a problem and a solution. We have just reached the end of line 8. We see our first and only period of the poem, marking the fact that we have come to the end of a segment. So what is the question or problem that we have seen? Well, the problem is, there is a kind of conflict between nature and civilization. Even though when humans are asleep, the buildings and the natural elements can live in harmony, as soon as the people wake, the noise and smoke and madness resumes. The personal problem for the speaker is that he does not have much opportunity to enjoy the beauty of nature because of the interference of the things of the city. Why? Because of the people of the city, we are messing up nature. He has found this wonderful early morning view, but he knows it will soon disappear. He wants to be able to enjoy this beauty, this quiet, this splendor, for more than just a few minutes each morning. In the next six lines, we will see an interesting solution to the speaker's problem. He finds that when he embraces the combination, the duality, in the harmony of city and nature, he finds something even more amazing than he did before. Never did the sun more beautifully steep or soak, immerse, imbue in his first splendor, valley, rock or hill. As usual, natural imagery comes with personification. The sun is referred to as his. The line is saying, the sun has never bathed these natural elements as much as it is now bathing the city. In other words, the sun is responding to the city even more majestically than it responds to things like rivers and rocks. Here we have an irony. The sun seems to be friendlier with the man-made things than it is with the natural things. Could this all be in the speaker's head? By the way, we see a hyperbole here that is similar to the one we saw in line 1. He says, never did sun more beautifully steep. He's saying that the steeping the soaking of the sunlight into the ships and domes and whatever. This is the most beautiful the sun has ever been. So this might be hyperbole again. And one more thing about steep. 
In the first section, he was admiring the early morning city, which was wearing the natural beauty. But we could see some tension between the natural things and the man-made things. Now there is no more tension. So the solution is to accept the city as a part of nature. In fact, it seems that the city is bringing out the best in nature, and nature is bringing out the best in the city. In the next line, the speaker talks about the profound effect that this sunlit city has on him. He has never seen or felt a calm so deep. The exclamation point shows his strong emotion. He is even more impressed than he was in the beginning. He has never seen such calm. So the calmness is visible over the city. He can see it. Also, he has never felt such calm. So the calmness is also within himself, in his soul. Also, look at how many times he says never. Three times in three lines. This repetition emphasizes that this view he's experiencing is the best he has ever seen. There's nothing better. There's never been anything better. The wonderful teamwork between city and nature is the most splendid thing in the world. Another special thing about line 11 is that this is the first time we've seen the first person singular I being used. This means the speaker is profoundly personally impacted by the display of nature and city, even more so than before. In the next line, we follow the trend of natural personification. The river glides. It moves smoothly and gracefully at its own sweet will. This is a great line. The word will here tells us that nature has a mind, a consciousness. It has a will. It is very much alive, not just doing things, but also thinking things. And the will of nature is sweet. It is pure. Nature only has good intentions. Nature is also shown to be powerful here. To glide means to move effortlessly. The river can push along tons upon tons of water with ease. Also, it is interesting to note that nature is now seen to be physically close to the speaker. Remember, he is standing on a bridge. He can see the combination of city and nature right where he stands. Beneath his feet is the concrete or metal of the bridge. But beneath the bridge is the gliding river. Next, the speaker, overwhelmed by emotion, cries out to God. He cannot contain his joy. Dear God, he shouts. And then, with more personification, he says that the houses are sleeping. Remember the calm that he spoke of earlier? Even the houses themselves are so calm that they are lulled to sleep, perhaps by the gliding river. We see the gentle hushing sibilance in the repeated sound. The very houses seem asleep. The last line gives us an intriguing metaphor. The city is now a mighty heart. Not just the city, but the city clothed in the beauty of nature. And the mighty heart is lying still. It is quiet and peaceful. What is the effect of this metaphor? A heart is a life force. It is what represents life, vitality, energy. The city is lively and energetic. But at this moment, it is sleeping in the grandeur of nature. Another shade of meaning here is that London can be considered the heart of England, since it is its capital and its busiest city, or at least one of its busiest cities. Yet another meaning here could be that his own heart, the speaker's heart, is now resting. When you are nervous or upset, your heart races. When you are calm, your heart rate slows down. Before we end the analysis, there is still something else that this last line has to offer. Well, two more things, actually. 1. A heart lies still. A heart stops beating, in a literal sense, when someone dies. Is the speaker seeing a beautiful London or a dead London? I think he's seeing a beautiful dead London. London is beautiful when it is dead, when the people are not on the streets, when the houses, meaning the people in the houses, are sleeping. And yet there's another thing that we can grasp here. The city is lying still. The city is still lying. The city is not telling the truth. Meaning, what the speaker now sees, this quiet, peaceful, scenic beauty, is not the real London. It is just an illusion that is broken the moment roosters start to crow, the moment alarm clocks start going off. 
This grandeur he now enjoys will go away once the house is awake. The city is lying to him. Notice how in all the praise that he gives the city, none of it involves the people. The people of the city are just an obstruction of the beauty. They taint the beauty. The beauty is not the people, but the nature combined with the man-made things. Finally, let's take a look at the poem's form. Since it is a sonnet, we have 14 lines. As we said earlier, the content of the poem is divided into two sections, a problem and a solution, a question and an answer. As for meter, we would expect to see the iambic pentameter. But actually, the lines here are very irregular, barely following any metric pattern. This could reflect the beautiful diversity of nature. As for rhyme scheme, you see the expected A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, D, with all perfect rhymes except for majesty, which is a slant rhyme. This makes the word stand out, and it emphasizes how majestic the scenery is. If you want to learn more about meter and rhyme and rhyme schemes, check out those lessons in the video description. For now, we've done a pretty good job at understanding this point.